Hi, I'm Art Bergeron and welcome to this month's seminar. Um, the focus of this seminar is about staying in control, that is staying in control of your lives uh, even if you're not doing well. Uh, so before I, I get into the text of this, as, as many of you know, I think w one of the reasons why I like doing elder law is that my clients identify with me and I identify with them because I'm old. I am uh, 72, I turned 72 in January. So with that in mind, let me tell you a story. So about two months ago, uh, I was about to be heading down to join my wife to visit our daughter and our two grandchildren because one of them, uh, my second, our second grandchild was just born. So I was working late and I was working at my uh, Westboro office at about seven o'clock at night. <clears throat> and suddenly I felt funny. And um, I said to myself, it just it's a strange thing came upon me and I said to myself, or actually said out loud, I think I might be having a stroke. Except that the words came out, I think I'm going to do a stroke. And I said to myself, well, that's not good. Uh, and then um, my arm, my right arm started getting numb. And I said to myself, now that's really not good. Uh, and was wondering what to do. <clears throat> do I call 911? Uh, I'm in an office, in the middle of an office park. Would they ever get there? Uh, if they got there, would I be dead? Uh, if I wasn't dead, would I be alive and healthy? Or, since I had just had a stroke, would I be alive and really permanently disabled? Or temporarily disabled, but maybe even permanently disabled? Uh, I mention this because you just don't know. You just don't know when it is that you're gonna lose control or that you really wanna have somebody else who can take control. So this presentation is about my friends Frank and Mary whom you've met many times and their kids, Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. Um, for this presentation, I really need you to know a little backstory about Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. Peter owns his own business, lives in New York. Uh, Paul's a software engineer, lives in California. Mary is a nurse, lives right here in Massachusetts. Um, and so, the question for, for Frank and Mary um, right now, they're both fine, they're still fine, is who do they want to have taking care of their um, health care decisions if one of them becomes incapacitated? Now, the usual response to this question from most of my clients is to bury your head in the sand. Not necessarily the best response because, of course, you say to yourself, well, this isn't really going to happen to me. I mean, everything is going to turn out fine, right? I'm, we're just going to live in our lives until we die. We're going to be buried in the backyard. You know, if, you know, that's all great, but you know, maybe not, maybe not. So the question for Frank and Mary then is, so what if Mary gets sick? Um, and, and in that case, who's going to make her health care decisions? Well, if she got sick and couldn't make her own decisions, the questions would be, first, does she have the ability to make her decisions? Second, is there a healthcare proxy if she can't? Third, if there is no healthcare proxy, are all the healthcare providers really going to, going to cooperate? Uh, and by the way, this used to happen a lot, you know, when, when we were all younger, that, that especially if, there was, if Mary got sick and Frank was around, that the doctors would say, so Frank, what do you want to do? And still many folks will do that. Certainly if Mary were, were incapacitated and Frank weren't around, the doctors wouldn't do that, right? But if Frank were around, still they would do it. But they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to. Frank, by virtue of being Mary's husband, has no power, legal power, to make her health care decisions for her. So if, the sister, if Mary is incapacitated and the folks are in, around the table don't want to be cooperative, and there's no healthcare proxy, then somebody has to go get a guardianship for Mary, which is going to cost a boatload of money. It's going to require court approval. First, it's going to require a doctor's certificate regarding competency. Then there will be filings. There'll be legal fees. It's just all bad. And that's in the case where everybody's cooperating. You should Im I can give you cases of where th people aren't cooperating. Things get really bad, right? So you never want to end up with guardianship as an alternative if there's an emergency. And, the, and it's such an easy way to deal with that, and that is to make sure that Frank and Mary have healthcare proxies. So, healthcare proxies. In order to do it, and, and once again, you may know all of this, you may know some of this, you may not be sure about this, but here, here, this runs through it. 
Uh, in order to have a valid healthcare proxy, you need two witnesses. The healthcare proxy does not need to be notarized. Um, <clears throat> a new one automatically revokes an old one. So every time, you, if you've done one in the past and then you went to the hospital and for, to the emergency room for some reason, and instead of giving them your old healthcare proxy, you signed a new one, what you did was actually inadvertently uh, uh, um, revoke the old one. Healthcare proxies do not cross state lines. Uh, each uh, state has its own healthcare proxy law. Um, sometimes folks here will abide by the, what is said in a healthcare proxy from a, across the state line, but often not, often not. So if you're, if you're visiting out of state a, a lot to a particular child, as we often visit our daughter in, uh, D, in uh, DC, uh, or if you're coming on vacation, I know I do a lot of work on, the, on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket where a lot of people are just visiting uh, or coming on vacation for prolonged periods. You want to make sure that you have two healthcare proxies because the fact that you have one that's valid in New York or in California does not mean that you can't have another one that is valid here in uh, Massachusetts. The healthcare proxy in all states though takes effect only when a doctor says that you can't make a healthcare decision on your own. Um, um, as to revocation of the healthcare proxy, this varies somewhat by state. Uh, the healthcare proxy um, ends, or the power of the proxy ends, if the doctor, your doctor determines that you can make a medical decision, or if you revoke your healthcare proxy. And for purposes of revocation, you are always presumed to be competent. So often, if you're, if you're thinking, oh my God, what if they, these people just start doing things that I don't want to do? No matter what your condition, you can always revoke your own healthcare proxy. So, the question is then, regarding your healthcare proxy, who will do what you want? You'd like to think that your spouse will do what you want, but what if your spouse has died? The question then is, who will do what you want? Not necessarily who has the medical expertise, but who will do what you want? Um, for example, in this case, Mary is a nurse, but the question isn't, does Mary have the expertise to read the charts and do all of this other stuff? The question is, knowing all of that information, because that information could be given to one of the other kids, would Mary be the one who would be most likely to do what you would do if you were still competent to do it? That's really the question. There isn't a correct decision regarding so many healthcare decisions. The question is, what is your decision? So, in addition to the healthcare proxy, you'll also probably, uh, or you may also want to have HIPAA uh, designations that you give to other people. What does that mean? Well, uh, HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, nobody, I just do this because no one actually knows what that stands for, so I actually tell you the words, um, which was done a number of years ago and, and which had nothing to do with these, or had a little to do with these issues, but not really also happened to include a section that talked about keeping people's medical records private and that said that unless you have specifically designated someone to have access to your medical records or to talk to your doctor, you, they, they can't talk to them. They can't release the records. Now, whereas regarding the healthcare proxy, you can only have one at a time. You can only have one person serving at a time. Um, regarding the HIPAA designation, you can name multiple people. So in this case, for example, Mary could have a healthcare proxy that names Frank as her primary and names somebody else, one of the other kids probably, as her alternate. But she can name all of those people in a HIPAA designation so that if she becomes incapacitated, or even if she's not in incapacitated, these people can, can have access to her medical records so that they can talk to her about it. Or if she's incapacitated, they can talk to each other about it. So they can kind of formulate what would probably be, the, what would ultimately be, be the best decision for Mary. So think about then, once you've done all that, think about what you want and write it down someplace. Now, there is a myth that, there, that if you write down a living will, if you write down instructions someplace, about how you're going to be treated, somehow that's legally binding. In some states, uh, that's true, living wills are legally binding, but in Massachusetts, that's not the case. However, um, that document, if it's in, especially if, it, if it's in your doctor's um, medical record, can be really useful to your doctor or others if there's an emergency situation. 
They can also be really useful to the person you've named as the healthcare proxy. Um, first, in allowing them to not feel guilty about any decisions that they're making, uh, if they're making a decision that is different from what they might have wanted. And secondly, in having conversations with the other people who aren't named as the healthcare proxy, so that everybody can feel like, oh, we're doing what mom really wanted, right? Um, it, that once again, that document also would help your doctor. Finally, there's the MOLST form, um, which used to be the, called the, a DNR, the Do Not Resuscitate form. The MOLST form, which is a little more comprehensive than that, it's, it's, it, once again, there, it's, a, it's, an, it's an abbreviation for Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, M-O-L-S-T. The MOLST form, technically, is not a form that, that is important because you signed it, although you will be asked to sign it to assent to what your doctor has said. It's important because it's a doctor's order. It's, a doc, it's an order from the doctor to everybody else down the medical food chain that says, basically, don't do what you otherwise have been trained to do. Uh, if, if you come upon a person whose heart has stopped, don't try to start it. Uh, that is, do not resuscitate that person. If you come upon a person who is not breathing, don't try to intubate, don't try to force air into that person's system, um, um, either manually or mechanically. And finally, and this is my personal favorite, um, it, it, if, despite the fact that you've been trained, if you find a person who, is, who is, cannot make decisions, if you, you know, go to a person's apartment and they're on the floor, you've been trained, bring that person to the hospital. In this case, the, uh, one of the boxes you can check on this form or that your can, doctor can check with your assent is don't bring me to the hospital. So many people tell me that they, do, they want to die at home. They do not want to die at a hospital or in a nursing home. Well, guess what? Uh, once you're in the hospital or the nursing home system, chances are you're not going to get back home. You are not going to die at home. So you, you, may, you may want to really consider, have, especially as you get older, if you're getting more frail, having a MOLST form that says that if, you're, if, if you are um, found by a, the EMT or whoever and you're at your home, that you want to stay at home so that the EMT will show up and, and put you in your bed as opposed to bringing you to the hospital. So that's, there's a whole set of questions around your medical care uh, if you can't make a decision. There are a whole, and remember, and, and I want to go back to the story that I started with, we think of these decisions as being end of life decisions. Oh, don't connect me to, a, to whatever, or don't leave me as a vegetable. And those, and those are important decisions at the end of life, but they may be decisions that really have to be made over a prolonged period of time. If you had that stroke, for example, and you are incapacitated for a long time. Similarly, if you're incapacitated for some time, um, uh, there may, it may be that someone needs to be handling your financial affairs and your other legal affairs. But it, typic it typically really revolves around handling your financial affairs. Who can go to the bank for you? Who can call the insurance company for you? Who can make all of the decisions that you're otherwise making? So in, in the case of Frank and Mary, I'm assuming that, that Frank and Mary have some assets. They have a house which is worth um, 400000 They have a joint savings account. Frank has an IRA. Uh, they have a joint annuity. They have a total assets of $1,100,000. These are substantial assets. Uh, someone, if you are incapable of, doing, of taking care of these things, needs to be taking care of these assets for you for any number of reasons. Just to pay the bills. It's really important to have someone to pay the bills. If, if one of you needs to qualify for mass health and there needs to be asset restructuring in order to be able to help somebody qualify for mass health, there needs to be a person with the power of attorney who can sign for you if you're not able to do it yourself. If you're nearing death and you want to, your kids to try to, to help to avoid the Massachusetts estate tax, they can do that by giving away assets on your behalf um, before you die. But these things have to happen before you die. Similarly, if you're trying to avoid probate, you may want somebody who, as, the pers as that power of attorney, who can um, move assets or give assets away before you die so they don't have to go through the probate process. There are any number of reasons why you want somebody who's going to be taking care of all of this. 
The question then is, who do you trust to take care of those finances? So, do you trust the uh, business owner who is in New York? Do you trust the software engineer who's in California? Do you trust the nurse? Typically in this case, just as in the healthcare proxy case, so often people will automatically say, well, I'm just gonna name the nurse, right? Because she's got the medical expertise. Typically in this case, they would say, oh, I'm gonna name the business owner. He's got business expertise. He's doing this kind of stuff all the time. But the question is, do you, you, you understand that, you, or you feel that Peter has that kind of business expertise, but do you know that, right? Do you really know what his situation is? If he's got a business, do you know if he has creditor problems? Does he have tax problems? You see Peter on occasion, because, but he lives in New York with his wife and his family. Does he have marital problems that you don't know about? It, about? Does he now need money, right? Or, and this is really the, 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 you know, the big variable because you don't know how things are gonna come out in the future. Might he need money in the future? In those situations, do you trust him? Do you trust him? Understanding that situations may change. Similarly, if you may have some issues about Peter, the question is, what about Paul or, uh, or uh, Mary Jr.? Either one of them, or they, neither of them may have what appears to be the financial sophistication that Peter has, but that's not the question, right? You can hire expertise. You can hire the person with your power of attorney can on your behalf, hire a lawyer, hire an accountant, hire a banker, hire an investment advisor. You can buy all that stuff. What you really can't buy is trust. You really can't buy trust. So the question is, Who's the person whom you trust the most? Once you've made that decision, then what is, your, what is your power of attorney gonna look like? So let me just talk about powers of attorney a little bit. First, kind of the basics. Um, uh, it is preferable to have your power of attorney notarized even though it is not legally required unless that attorney is actually using the power of attorney to transfer real estate or to do something else regarding a document that's gonna be recorded in the registry of deeds but it's preferable. Uh, reason, the reason is most people, most laymen, don't know that a power of attorney doesn't need to be notarized and are therefore suspicious of one that is not notarized. Um, no witnesses are needed for a power of attorney. Uh, so if you get that notarization, you don't need any other, other uh, witnesses. Um, the power of attorney, um, once, you have, once you have signed it, you can revoke it at any time, at any time. But you should remember that if you, do, if you execute a power of attorney and then you later execute a new power of attorney, executing the second one didn't revoke the first one. So whenever you're doing a new power of attorney, if you're changing the names of the players on the power of attorney, you probably want to take that second step of, notify, <coughs> excuse me, of notifying the person you had named on the earlier power of attorney that you were revoking it. Also, if you have bank accounts, you may want to take the extra step of notifying your bank that you have revoked that old power of attorney. Uh, this is especially the case if, you, once again, you've got a family situation and, and suddenly uh, you've named someone on your power of attorney and their situation has changed. You think you really need to revoke it. In that case, you really need to notify the, your financial institutions that that power of attorney has been revoked. Once again, signing a new one does not revoke an old one. Once you've got the basics of your power of attorney, there are some important things in the fine print. Um, you want to make sure if you have real estate and you want your attorney to be dealing with your real estate, that that power to deal with the real estate, to sign deeds, mortgages, etc., is specifically is specified in the power of attorney. Similarly, if you want your power of attorney agent to have gifting power, to be able to give things of yours away to anyone, to any third party or to themselves, that needs to be specified in the power of attorney. Um, you also, if you're doing this power of attorney for the purpose of allowing someone on your behalf, perhaps, to help you qualify for mass health, um, where, where that qualification is going to require that assets be transferred out of your name, typically to your spouse, you wanna make sure that there's no cap on the amount uh, that, a power of, that the, per, the power of attorney agent can give away on your behalf. It's very common, <clears throat> excuse me, 
in powers of attorneys that have, that have been done simply for tax purposes that you'll find that, you, that there is a cap on the amount that can be given away. It's often related to the, the federal gift, gift tax. Um, if you have an existing power of attorney, it would be worthwhile for you to check that to make sure that that cap isn't there if you want to make sure that the person with the power of attorney, A, can move assets around on your behalf in order to qualify you for mass health, or B, can move assets around, can give assets away before you die so that you can minimize the estate tax and avoid the probate process following your death. Um, finally, in the power of attorney, you can, you can name the person whom you've named in your power of attorney as your agent or anybody else to be your conservator if a conservator needs to get appointed. And so who would be the best person to act as that power, in that power of attorney capacity? Often, uh, especially if you're younger, you'll, you'll, you'll find yourself naming your spouse. That may not end up being the best person though, if the both of you are old and, and, you're feeling, and you feel like, well, you know, I've always, I've always had my spouse, but really, does, does my spouse gonna wanna be running around doing all this stuff if I'm incapacitated? You always wanna have an alternate. That alternate may be one of the kids. You can name really anybody that you want. Uh, and you can name people jointly and severally. On a power of attorney, you can say, well, instead of just naming one person, if that person can't do it, you name somebody else. You can name several people. The question really though is what happens if Frank has died? Now what? You may want to name one of your kids. You can name two or three of them jointly um, so that all of them need to sign on your behalf regarding any decision. That is a lot of work, especially if, the, if the, your kids are all over the place. You can name two or three of them jointly and severally so that any one of them can sign the power of attorney. That's a, a more common alternative. Um, but then the question is, what happens if there's trouble? What happens if Frank has died and, and Mary is now concerned about how the power of attorney is being handled? Well, Mary can always revoke the power of attorney. And if the other kids who are thinking that Mary has really kind of, you know, doesn't have the capacity to deal with things, the other kids could always file a request for a conservator and the conservator could then, then revoke the power of attorney on Mary's behalf. But the question then will be, well, if, when Mary originally did the power of attorney, did Mary say not only was Peter named as the attorney, but Peter was also supposed to be named as the conservator. So there are issues that you kind of want to need to deal with. Regarding the conservatorship, and, and once again, this comes up in this kind of situation. Frank has died, Mary's, kind of, Mary's capacity is diminished. People are wondering about Peter and wondering what they do. Well, any child could file for, the cons for a conservatorship they will need a doctor's certificate uh, based on a, a, a um, um, based on seeing having seen Mary within 30 days of the day of that certificate, saying that that it appears that Mary is not competent to make her own legal decisions. There are time delays involved with this. This can cost a lot of money. I've seen it. I've seen in the case of uncontested conservatorships, it costs about five thousand dollars. I saw one especially brutal one where the total cost was $100,000 if you added up everybody's attorney's fees. And if you file for that conservatorship and you fail, and you're one of the kids, um, you're not gonna get reimbursed for your, fi for your filing costs, right? So there were real possible issues. One other mechanism that is commonly used both to avoid probate and to deal with these kinds of problems is, tr is a trust. Here, Trusts 101. A trust is a relationship between two kinds of people, a trustee, that is the person who is in legal control, and the beneficiaries, who are the people for whom the trustee is managing things. Often, people will create a revocable trust. Uh, if they are getting older and they want to avoid the probate process, they'll create a revocable trust, name themselves as the trustee, typically for the benefit of their kids, but they'll specify that when, when they die, one of the, or if they become incapacitated, one of the kids will take over as the successor trustee and can then immediately deal with assets. Uh, that's it. They can also create an irrevocable trust. That is an, a, a trust over which they do not continue to have control. Uh, in that case, you would typically name somebody else as the trustee, typically one of your kids, but you'd retain the power to remove the trustee if you thought that that trustee wasn't doing things that were appropriate. The tr if the trust is amendable, that means you can always change the rules so you can keep control of the assets. 
Revocable trusts um, do a lot for probate avoidance. Um, the question, though, is going to be if Frank has died, once again, if Mary is the sole trustee and Mary is losing competence, how do we deal with replacing Mary as the trustee? Same issue is with the power of attorney. You can build something in saying who the new trustee is going to be in the trust, or you can say right in the trust that the other beneficiaries, the other kids, could, in the event that they thought that Paul was abusing his authority, remove him as trustee and name somebody else. I'm not going to go through that in detail, but the main one, one final observation is to remember when you're dealing with an irrevocable trust and transferring assets to your kids as the trustees, they've all got skin in the game. Ultimately, they all have an interest in that they are probably going to be receiving assets following your death. So, and you don't want to assume in any of those cases that one of them is extremely well finan off financially. You just don't know. Don't count other people's money. People's situation changes. So Mary in these cases probably is going to want to retain a right to remove the trustee. She, probably, she may want to specify that in the event that she's incapacitated that the other beneficiaries by a majority vote can remove a trustee or you may, may actually want to, want to name a, thir a third uh, outside person as a trustee. So the goal of this exercise is simply to be aware of these documents, to give yourself peace of mind so that you're sleeping well because you're knowing that if an emergency happens, you're going to st stay in control in that the people that you named are the right people that you named are going to have control. If you have any questions on any of this, don't hesitate to give me a call at 508-860-1470 or you can see this um, presentation again on our, U on our uh, Frank and Mary's YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.